So uh, this is the future challenges in learning and reasoning. Um, so the keynote speakers from the conference will be looking at the various uh, aspects of uh, future challenges for this field of learning and reasoning. Um, before we start, <clears throat> I realize this is my last opportunity to thank Nikos Katsouris and the, and the team at the National Center for Scientific Research in Athens. And I hope you will all agree that uh, Ichklar 2021 has been a transformative event and the first of what I imagine will all will, and hope will be a long-standing series. 30 years after the first ILP conference in, in Portugal, we've seen a resurgence in the interest in combining learning and reasoning. Nikos and his team have achieved the Herculean task of, boost, of boost, uh, boosting the participation to over 500 registrants compared with at most 80 registrants in any ILP conference to date in the last 30 years. So a set of great talks and intense uh, audience participation has made this, I think a, you'll agree with me, a very memorable um, meeting. Thank you from all of us for creating such a memorable and smoothly executed event. So- uh, Steven, thank you so much, but I, but I have very good help from, from the study committee and all you guys, so it's not only me, at least for the program. Well, I think you, you, I still think that you did a, a Herculean job. So uh, let's go on to the panel now. So I'd like to ask the panelists to make a brief two to three minute uh, position statement. Uh, please be brief to allow other panelists to make their key points. This will allow us plenty of time for questions. Uh, would those in the audience place their questions in the chat and label each one with the name of the panelists that you would like to answer them? And we'll try to leave plenty of time uh, for them to do so. Uh, so I'm just going to use the, the order that we have in the uh, program for uh, the uh, position statements. So we'll start with uh, Hector Geffner. Okay. Thanks, Stephen. So thanks, everyone. So hi, everyone. So good to be here again. So I have a couple of slides. Let's see if I can squeeze them in. Uh, in the three minutes we have, oops. Okay, the first, can you see this? Okay, the first is yep. a joke. Okay, just to start it lightly and to get us in the mood, okay? So we need artificial intelligence for social good because natural intelligence is busy in, in other pursuits. Okay, so that's my, uh, my, my take on some of these. Uh, issues, but let's get serious. And uh, if I come up with these, whoops. Okay, so from the scientific point of view, okay, so I, I like uh, Chris' technical challenges, okay? So here are my favorite ones. So I think that the integration of deep learning and with background knowledge, okay, that's a lot of what we are doing uh, in this communities and so on is great, but it's not enough. So I think one of the uh, most important challenges is basically learning uh, the background knowledge, okay? What is actually the background knowledge is what you learn that you then can reuse. And in this sense, I tend to think that it's useful to distinguish background knowledge from these mm, generic priors, okay? related to what um, Gary or, or Josh talk about this, uh, the Spark uh, core uh, cognition or uh, when you're learning domain independent target languages. Okay, and this is different okay, from, from having a specific domain knowledge. So I think that uh, a, a big challenge okay, for, for all of us is learning knowledge that can be reused, okay, no matter the input. And eventually, we should be able to play, let's say, the deep reinforcement learning game uh, while showing the computational payoff in many of these settings of learning and using these symbolic representations or these representations learnable languages and so on. Okay, so that's that's basically my take on, on the technical challenges. Great, thank you. Um, so, Gary. I promised I would have one slide. And here it is, hopefully, oops. So um, anybody who's ever seen me talk before has probably heard me make fun of deep learning and <laughs> talk about some of the challenges therein. 
I'll just blank the slide for one second. And I did that uh, yesterday, as I always do, um, showing deep learning uh, suicide counselors telling people to commit suicide and uh, making various visual errors and so forth. The question is, what do we do about it? So the argument that I'm making is that deep learning is not a good foundation in the sense of <coughs> being something that we can build the rest of AI on. So what do we want to build AI on? What is the stable bedrock that's equivalent to an operating system? I think here are seven minimal requirements. I won't go through every word that's on the slide, but <coughs> I think unless we build the following seven things, we won't have an AI that we can trust. Rich cognitive models, extensive real world knowledge, representations of relationships between entities, compositionality in which we understand holes in terms of their parts, common sense knowledge, reasoning, and human values. I think we have to do all of those and we can't just do a lot of statistical association um, by itself and expect um, AI to work. Of course, statistics will play a role. Uh, deep learning may play a role. Um, we have to learn lots over data, but we need these seven things if, if we're going to build a working AI system that we can trust. Thank you. Thank you, Gary, and thanks for keeping it concise here, yeah? um, and a, a great set of challenges from both you and Hector. So, um, Francesca. Yes, so uh, I don't have slides, but um, basically, um, um, so let me focus on uh, something that I also mentioned in my talk this morning, uh, that I think that um, we need to, I mean, my focus right now is to understand whether uh, some concept of metacognition may have a role in uh, combining learning and reasoning um, and, uh, um, and also in the challenge that I agree with Hector and uh, I think that Gary was about representing and reasoning and learning uh, the knowledge uh, that can be reused. Um, and uh, I also agree with the embedding human values uh, that I think they, in order to do that, a combination of learning and reasoning is exactly what you need, you know, because we all know that uh, uh, you cannot embed human values only by learning from data. Uh, you may have seen the latest um, Delphi, you know, judgments, um, uh, moral judgments, right? Assessments uh, that uh, that shows some uh, uh, vulnerabilities instead in terms of, uh, you know, moral judgments, uh, learning only from data. Um, so there needs to be a combination of uh, data driven learning, but also okay, explicit knowledge as Hector said has to be reused. So metacognition in my view, um, understanding better and the embedding of human values is important. Great, uh, thank you, Francesca. Um, so uh, another great, uh, very interesting set of challenges. Um, Josh. Okay, um, I'll just uh, put up one slide, which was just my conclusion for, for people who didn't get to see the talk. So, you know, I, I think it's very resonant with what all the previous panelists have said. Um, for me, coming from comp cognitive science, computational modeling of human intelligence, and being interested in building more human-like forms of AI, I look to the development of human intelligence starting from early infancy on up through childhood and into adulthood as a potential roadmap for how we might build a, an AI system that is actually human-like and interacts with humans in a meaningful, trustworthy, mutually valuable way in the human world. Um, what I talked about in my talk was just that, you know, I think we need to get beyond a lot of our early dichotomies that the field has argued about, recognize that there's both a lot of stuff that's built in and very sophisticated learning procedures. And we have at least some steps, small steps, but good, I think, foundations, as, as Gary said, I think this kind of picture um, is a better foundation than just statistical learning or just you know er earlier ways of trying to build AI systems. Um, I talked about certain kinds of ideas from game engines as ways to capture the spell key core knowledge ideas. And what I think many people here um, agree with is that there's some kind of broad sort of neurosymbolic probabilistic modeling and inference synthesis of methods that can give us um, tools for learning and reasoning with these richer representations uh, that include in, in the work that we've done, we've emphasized the ideas of probabilistic programs and probabilistic programming, 
program induction and program synthesis um, as as ways to sort of build these systems. But going forward, I think the the if the biggest challenge is that if we want to build systems that are have general intelligence and that really do learning and really do reasoning, what we have right now are mature tools for doing for systems that do a lot of general purpose learning and very little reasoning. So you know the examples of like of large language models that Gary has talked about. Um, is, is one instance of a system that does very general purpose learning, and it might look like it's doing reasoning, but I think I agree that there's very little actual reasoning under the hood. And then we have systems like, for example, probabilistic programming languages and the kind of you know, model-based systems you can build with those that are very general tools for reasoning under uncertainty and, have, and do a really nice job of capturing a lot of domains of human cognition, but they do very little learning. With, with recent advances in program synthesis, we've been able to write little chunks of code and people are making progress towards basically learning bigger chunks of code. But I think we have to be honest that um, we, don't, we have nothing like a general purpose um, learning approach that works for these general purpose reasoning systems. So looking forward, trying to talk about what are the ways that we can combine the best of these pictures to have something that is as general a learning system as say GPT-3 or other large language models, but as general a reasoning system as the kind of models we've been able to build in probabilistic programming languages. I think that would be extremely interesting for the field. Great, so concentrate on the, the intersection between general purpose learning and general purpose reasoning. Um, yeah, sounds good. So um, Francesca Toni. Francesca? <laughs> Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, because my audio is a bit funny. So I will share a couple of slides as well. Um, right, uh, so for those of you who have not uh, um, uh, listened to my talk, uh, I have uh, uh, focused my talk around the uh, so-called interactionist uh, view of human reasoning which is uh, in competition with the intellectualist approach, um, focusing on the observation that uh, humans are particularly uh, bad at uh, producing reasons. Uh, they, they, the reasons often uh, incorporate a, a, a kind of my side bias and uh, people are, are not very good uh, at assessing their own reasons, but, they, but humans are very good at evaluating the reasons by others, and often when they do so, they are unbiased uh, and, uh, and demanding uh, towards, towards the others. So the interactionist, uh, interactionist view of uh, human reasoning uh, sees that uh, you know, kind of reasons play a role in after the fact explanation and justifications, uh, not in the actual process uh, of inference itself, um, and that reasoning is not an alternative to, to kind of intuitive inference, but it is um, uh, it, it kind of a use of inference about reasons uh, and points towards a more social understanding of reasoning, uh, in particular within a dialogical setting. So building upon this uh, existing uh, theory of human reasoning, uh, can we learn something in the context of AI? And in particular, can we learn something about the combination of uh, learning and reasoning uh, by machines. Um, in particular, uh, the two questions that I guess uh, came out of my, of my presentations are uh, uh, based upon the fact that people use reasons to explain and justify their decisions. Um, should also machines uh, use reasons to explain their outputs, no matter how they are obtained. Maybe we are too focused on, on getting reasoning and learning together, and we forget the fact that no matter how the learning is, is taking place, we need to be able to convey explanation uh, and use reasoning for that. And the other question is, given that, according to the uh, interactionist approach, reasoning thrives in the back and forth of conversation when people can exchange arguments and counter arguments, should we develop argumentative integrations of learning and reasoning that lend themselves to supporting kind of conversations that can accommodate naturally the injection of background knowledge, for example. Hector mentioned, kind of mentioned how important it is to learn background knowledge, but what about getting some of this background kind of knowledge directly uh, from humans in conversations with machines? Um, so these are, I guess, the main questions I want to raise, and that's it. 
Great, thank you, uh, Francesca. Um, so again, a great set of uh, things to think about. Um, humans producing reasons, but good at criticizing others and about um, uh, combining the learning and reasoning by machines and accommodating conversations with background knowledge from uh, learned from conversations. All sounds great. Um, so Jiwa Joe, are you there? Yeah, hi. Hi. Hi, Stephen. Hi. hi. Okay. So I just have one slide. Uh, oh, great. Can okay, you see the slides? Yes. Okay. Uh, so I just um, want to mention two challenges, I feel. The first is when we want to combine machine learning together with uh, logical reasoning, we may want to do some joint symbolic and numerical optimization. And uh, the difficulty is uh, popularly used gradient-based optimization, such as the stochastic gradient search, popularly used in deep neural networks, are not directly applicable to symbols because we could not do the derivative about symbols. So currently, there are two possible ways. Seems the first is try to convert the symbolic things to numeric. For example, we can design a loss function. But the problem is, at, at least at present, we do not have any guarantee about the consistency. Uh, for example, when we design the not, not numeric loss function, even if when we reach the optimal of the numeric loss function, we do not have any theoretical guarantee about whether we have really reached the original symbolic ones, the optimal. Another way is to do derivative-free optimization. Uh, this is something we have taken in our effective learning. This is a, a optimization without gradients. But the problem is the efficiency or scalability is not good. So uh, if we want to do something further or better, we may need to develop some joint symbolic numeric optimization techniques. The second challenge I want to mention is how to enable machine learning to exploit both logical reasoning and the knowledge graph. Now we have many work about uh, using machine learning together with logical reasoning and also some tech, some, some uh, solutions in natural language precision by using machine learning together with logic graph. But how to combine them together? In this way, we may need to do some trade-off between the rigorousness of logic reasoning and the flexibility of logic graph and so on. Can we just do some puristic, heuristic combination, or can we have some theoretical guarantee? As this is what we want to mention. Thanks. Great. Can you leave um, that slide up for half a second? Um, I'd just like to say that the ellipsis, the dot, dot, dot in the middle of the slide is one of the most important things for the field to fill in. So Jiwa, uh, thank you very much. Um, I, I enjoyed your joint symbolic optimization. It, it reminded me of uh, what statisticians talk about when they talk about model estimation versus parameter estimation, because um, these are these uh, ideally should be combined together um, in a you know in a in a representation that can support both the construction of the model and its parameterization. Anyway, so um, I'm waiting for I'm looking through for questions. We've got one question um, from uh, Dimitar Kazakov. Uh, who the question is for Gary and Josh, what are the most basic conceptual categories we should start to include as prior knowledge in our AI systems? The most basic Aristotelian categories, quantity, quality, agency, relations, are already present in the data types of our programming and representation languages. I think in terms, Josh and I may be pretty similar here. I think in terms of space, time, causality, representations of people, objects, places, and so forth, uh, very much the way that Liz Spelke has talked about things in cognitive development in, in terms of core cognitive categories. Um, you need to be able to represent the things in the world in order to learn about them. That doesn't mean you need to know, for example, that people could wear glasses or don't wear glasses, but you need to have a, a class of things that is probably animals, that is people, in order to organize the rest of your experience around it. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd agree. I'd say that if you, and I, I agree also with what the questioner saying that that actually in the data types of our basic programming and representation languages we have a lot of what we need there also i would say if you look to the basic kinds of data types or, or sort of built-in standard representational components in game engines that's a that's a surprisingly maybe a, a way to capture many if not all of the spell key type core knowledge ideas including objects agents and places and uh you know 
it's, it's very very interesting to me that that like the game engine industry basically came up with um, good efficient approximate representations of these aspects of the world that have similar although not identical engineering kind of characteristics and desiderata to what we might want for core knowledge in a in a robot or what evolution might have selected for in in our brains and as we put those together with sort of the basic kind of um, uh, you know, logical structures and abstractions um, in modern programming languages. I, I do think that gives us a lot of what we might be looking for there. Is, um... If I can just extend on that, I think game engines are a good way to think about this. I have a disagreement with Josh about whether people use them to say the same extent as maybe he thinks and we can maybe reprise that argument or not. But um, I think game engines give us a lot of what we might need for AI, regardless of the status in people. Um, the thing that I think they're weak on is, is causality. So people can do a lot of causal reasoning that in general game engines don't need to do. So they have pre-programmed well, workflows don't do any around. Reasoning. <laughs> right? Yeah. Also well, I mean, you could but... argue there's a form of reasoning, but yeah, they're they're not really reasoners per se. Um, they're not at all reasoners. Yeah. I mean, again, well, I'm, like I'm, I'm... if I reason, can I go from if I have a game character that could go from place A to place B? Um, it'll use the A star algorithm, which is a form of reasoning. I mean, so yeah, right. you could fuss over it, but so they're, they're, in so the in, broad in, sense, I agree with you, right? They're not really set up to do reasoning, particularly causal uh, kinds of reasoning. And so that we can't get, but if we could get to just game engine plus kind of deep learning, able to then have those entities available even to an off the shelf reasoner, but we had that richness of representation that would really help. Yeah, but so, but for me, and at least in the approach we develop, um, the reasoning, including causal reasoning, probabilistic reasoning, probabilistic causal reasoning for thinking about counterfactuals and hypotheticals and so on, you know, in our picture, that comes from probabilistic programming languages the, of the sort that Noah Goodman, Vakash Mansingh, and right. others have built. Those it, give you very general, powerful tools for causal, counterfactual, probabilistic reasoning. And then the idea is you wrap, let's say, you know, rich simulation programs like the sort you have in game engines inside those the 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 game engine like physics engine say or game ai provides the basic um uh, i would call it causally structured generative model but you don't actually right. get any reasoning until you put it inside a reasoning engine um can we agree. we've got another couple of questions here um so question uh to all uh but mainly to josh um so josh let other people talk about this too this is what about instincts how to model, adopt, and enable them in AI as something sort of built in? I mean, this is possibly related to the last question, but do you have other things to say about that? Uh, well, yeah, by, I mean, by instincts, there's many things you could mean by that, right? Like, so for example, Steve Pinker famously wrote about the language instinct in, in ways that I think influenced a lot of you know my thinking and Gary's thinking and, and all that. I think we, you know, there's a, there's a lot of like instincts aren't just behaviors like, um, the instinct to walk, um, but there are, there are there's built-in cognitive structure. So the spell key core knowledge is another version of that. So, I mean, I, I I'm not exactly sure what you are getting at there, um, but I think we sh you know we shouldn't be afraid of building in um, structure, whether it's knowledge or kinds of uh, policies, for example. I think a key challenge, maybe just to to raise a, a challenge that I'm sure we're all aware of and interested in, is um, you know, if you build things in, whether it's knowledge or behaviors, how do you make those sort of pure positives, things that enable uh, faster learning, more better generalization without being limited by them? Because there's this rhetoric in the field that if you build in knowledge, then it's, it's, it, it hurts you in the end because it constrains you and you never know what's the right thing to build in. And you know, cl clearly that is sort of true for humans. There are ways in which our minds are fundamentally limited. But I think from an AI point of view, for the most part, humans and individual humans and, and culture, collective intelligence is a dramatic example of how you can build things in and not be constrained by that, transcend that and have systems for learning and reasoning that can be enabled by, but transcend um, the, what might be the limits of what's built in. That's a key challenge for us to think about. I will say there's a second meaning of instinct and in that we should be less concerned with it, which is like, we are motivated by instincts for food, sex, shelter, territory, et cetera. We don't want our AI systems to do that. It, it's fine that they simply uh, follow the goals that, that we set for them. And hopefully maybe like moral values, problem. for example. I mean, that's- I Moral values, yes. You've talked about Francesca and others, so maybe that's- Yeah, yeah but, uh, but this uh, ability, Josh, to 
to take the knowledge, but not be constrained, being able to transcend, as you say, isn't that the ability connected to the ability to learn new things from ex your experience, your, you know, your, your, uh, what you're seeing around you, you know, what you are reading, what you are uh, listening to. So that, I think the, that learning of new things that are not coded in, uh, that's uh, essential, right? In, in not being- Yeah, it's not clear that you need an instinct, but you do, it is clear that you, or, or, I mean, I guess it depends how you define the term. You do need your system to do some kind of active learning, to have algorithms that tell it what part of the <coughs> space to search, where, where to get information. So, I mean, there, there's instincts like, I want territory, we don't need those. There's instincts in the sense of having some prior structure of language such that the system can learn the rest of language. And there are instincts in the sense of, I'm built so that I go out and learn these things. So there, there are multiple meanings there. And, yeah, and some there, are is another, and some are there is another, I think, related thing about uh, moral uh, and human values that you mentioned several times that human beings are kind of local. They live in a certain society, in a certain culture. You know, uh, I mean, we have a body and we are one person and we live in a place. I mean, because we can move from one place to another one and so on. But, ma but machines uh, can be replicated at scale and be used everywhere. So that's also another challenge that I don't know how to resolve because human beings have uh, different values, uh, different priorities about values, depending on the culture and that they're being... Uh, Grow, growing up, but how do we deal that with machines where machines can be built somewhere and then replicated everywhere? So they are not related to a specific culture. <clears throat> so specific priorities about values and moral judgments. So I mean, that's- I, I think there's there are two <coughs> fundamental questions. One is how do you build a machine to respect any value? So for example, don't cause harm to humans, which of course I'm yeah. borrowing from Asimov. Yeah. We don't know how to code that. We can assume that it's close to what we want, but the first problem is how do you code it at all? And the second is actually there are a lot, of, <coughs> excuse me, a lot of subtly different versions of these things. And you know, under what circumstance might you allow harm um, to be caused by inaction, for example, thinking about the Asimov things, um, then it actually gets really hard. So we're not even to the point where we can actually encode those specific values, but we should also be thinking about what values we do want to respect. I, I give the example of GPT-3 counseling suicide. Like we know we don't want our systems um, to counsel suicide and we don't even know how to do that yet. But there's, a, you know, what about euthanasia, for example? You know, do we want our systems um, to allow for that under what circumstances? And so there's mm -hmm. a whole nother set of questions, which probably shouldn't principally be solved by AI researchers, the way AI researchers should be involved, um, but by people wiser than us. So we've got, a, we've got more questions here. Um, so here's one from Steve Moyle. Were he still with us, uh, would Alan Turing see that uh, artificial intelligence or machine intelligence has made sufficient progress given the effort spent from the 71 years since his uh, MIND article was published? I don't know about Turing, but I think McCarthy and Minsky and Newell and Simon would all be depressed. I mean, the, the famous thing from Minsky was assigning vision as a summer project. Like these guys thought these problems would be solved by now. And, and I, you know, Turing had slightly different interests and, and I never talked to him the way I talked to some of these other folks. Um, and so I'm not quite sure, but I know that, um, I, I guess I talked to the other four that I mentioned and they would not be pleased with where we are. So um, I, the question about uh, Turing and his child machine came up with uh, Josh's talk. Um, so uh, Josh, do you want to comment on that? I don't know if you actually read th right th I mean, through I that paper. Yeah, but I mean, I'm quite I, a lot I, about what he expected to happen, at least by the year 2000. Yeah, well, I mean, I think I think nobody should be held responsible for their predictions that far. You've got a lot I right. Mean, I mean, if yeah, you read yeah, the paper, I mean, it, you'd find that. Yeah, I mean, um, I don't remember the details of what Turing predicted by the year 2000. Um, I think it, it'd be very interesting to have to revisit that paper, its its ideas, its predictions. I think that could be a great topic for a symposium. And I, I do often find myself wondering, 
um, you know, what would Turing think of GPT-3? Um, of course, you can ask GPT-3 that question, probably like many people I have. <laughs> and, you know, I, I, I think he'd be impressed and also um, quite aware of, of its uh, limitations and interested in its limit, interested in both what it can do and what it can't do. Because, you know, Turing was also very interested in statistics and statistical inference and the ideas of information theory. In some sense, you know, um, GPT-3 is like Shannon's dream, <laughs> uh, but Shannon's dream was not unrelated to things that Turing um, and Good worked on early on. And it's, you know, it's, it's interesting what, what kinds of things come from just trying to build a really good predictive language model and what is there in its latent representations. And to me, and to, I think many of us, it's even more interesting what isn't there and how you, how you might get that into the picture. So the, the notebook quote that you made, I think you slightly misquoted it because his intention, if you look through the rest of the paragraph, was to say that learning cannot happen just by um, filling up a notebook. You cannot have unbiased um, uh, learning. And uh, that predated the no free lunch theorem by uh, you know, half a decade. Um, and he, he gave a very strong kind of a, a numerical argument in there as to why that must be the case. So it's really, yeah, I, is mean, worth I mean, I, mean, I, I, I definitely was, was oversimplifying there. At the same time, I think um, uh, he, you know, he did, he did suggest something that was, um, that, 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 that emphasized the knowledge coming from outside rather than from what was built in, which 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 is sensible, right? I mean, because um, right, I, I don't know. I, let's let's not do Turing exegesis here. I think it, I think that would be a really interesting topic for for another thing. And Turing was brilliant and an inspiration for all of us. So I certainly don't want to. Um, uh, um, Stephen, I want to take uh, uh, be, be some of these questions. Over, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so. Okay. For those of us who have been involved in AI for many years, so in AI, I think that we have made progress when we sort of can get technical formulations of certain problems, okay? So get the mathematics mm. right of certain type of genetic structures and address them with suitable algorithms. I think that uh, I'm a bit more skeptical, okay? When we look at the grand picture or, or, or some of these, uh, interesting ideas from Cox Science. I think that the, some of the main ideas that came up from AI in the last few decades is when we got technical with mathematics and algorithms. And I think that actually there is a very central problem in this community, okay? I want to emphasize, I emphasize that in, in my talk, which is, okay, as, as, as many of us says, we have already learners and we have solvers. What we don't do not have are uh, uh, the, the crosstalk, okay? So we are supposed to learn the representations on which we can do reasoning, okay? We have to learn the representation, have the semantics and we can reason. And that's a technical problem, okay? And I think so there is a question about what to work on. I think that it's a central technical problem, okay? That you have to give a good formulation and to address it mathematically and computationally. That's the way we're gonna do progress in the field. That, that's great. And it, it ties into Luke Durat's question uh, to everyone, which was um, most approaches to integrating learning and reasoning focus on one of two perspectives and sometimes reduces one to the other. It's clear when looking at neurosymbolic reasoning is often delegated to the neural network. I believe the focus on combining learning and reasoning should be to provide a kind of bi-directional interface layer between the learning and the reasoning part. The central question is then what should that interface look like? So what should it look like? Can I jump in there? Yeah. Um, I think that there are two other questions that closely <coughs> relate, which are Artur's and Lewis Lamb's, which is basically what's our semantics here? So the large language models are amazing and they proceed entirely without a real semantics and all of their flaws follow from lacking a real semantics and it, i won't be able to pronounce but i'll try jihua's uh talk with the ellipsis that i pointed out i think that the answer to joint symbolic numerical optimization has to go through an interface that is a form of semantics and that until we get to that semantics 
we're wasting our time if it, assuming that we're trying to get through AGI rather than just recommendation engines or something like that. So you, you can build a recommendation engine without any real semantics, just, you know, this happened and then that happened. But if you want to give medical advice or really understand what you're reading or anything like that, you actually need a semantics. And <clears throat> the semantics of a deep learning system is incredibly superficial and does not support, for example, probabilistic reasoning or the, um, in, in the sense that I, probabilistic programming in the sense that Josh really wants to be able to do it and that we should want um, to be able to do it. So I think all of these questions revolve around what is the semantics that we want to work towards? And we need to take it as a basis, baseline assumption, foundation assumption, that that is in fact necessary that any solution that does not drive towards the semantics that you can then do other analysis over just isn't the right answer. So semantics is the interface. Um, so. Krisha Broder uh, says a question for Francesca Rossi. Um, is there a role for natural logic in reasoning as opposed to formal logic, e.g. in human system one? Uh, yeah, so uh, I, I just wanted to get uh, Francesca that has raised his hand, her hands long ago to say something, and then let's go back to the question. Go, go on, sorry. I mean, I saw her. Thanks a lot, Thanks a lot for that. Thank you for, you know, for noticing this. Yes, I would like actually to build up on, uh, on uh, uh, Gary's answer uh, uh, and uh, uh, Luke's question and also link it to the question on, uh, on uh, causal models and, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, extracting or using causal models uh, for machine learning. To me, the two issues are very much connected and potentially also connected to the uh, question that Francesca raised on uh, where are, you know, human values coming from and different settings may require different human values uh, as it happens in society. So to me, the, the point of uh, designing AI systems that can closely interact with humans and can, uh, can closely kind of sync to human is very much uh, connected to this as well. Uh, when we put together learning and reasoning uh, in a way which is not uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, in a sense pushed uh, from one viewpoint, we need to think in my mind of the two components as interacting in a, in a if you like, conversational way, in a dialogical way in which they both keep their own, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, identity while being integrated. Um, in my own research, I've seen that often injecting uh, uh, knowledge from humans into machine learning helps machine learning, uh, either by making it more powerful, faster, for example, in reinforcement learning, or by helping uh, humans debug the machine learning when it got it wrong. Uh, because we know that machine learning is not perfect and it may learn the wrong thing. So it's a task of the humans to somewhat uh, be able to inject information into, into these tools. Similarly, we can get reasoners and, uh, and learners to uh, kind of integrate and, uh, and cooperate. Uh, same kind of holds for uh, the human values, different values. Again, there needs to be, a, if you like, a connectivity that allows humans to interfere and intervene uh, in the context uh, of, this, uh, of these settings. Um, and analogously for causal models, I think causal models uh, are something that may emerge from machine learning techniques, but humans may know it better. And there needs to be an opportunity for injecting causal knowledge into machines while they learn more. So all of these are challenges that maybe require a, a semantics as a link between the machine and the human as much as it does between components and components of machines. Great. So the use of language as a kind of glue between agents, including human and machine agents. Yes, potentially. So does anybody else want to comment on that or other others of the questions? No, we can, we can go yeah, back to the other yeah, questions. <laughs> so the question about natural logic in reasoning. Um, as opposed to formal logic. So in my view, uh, then in mentioned system one. So well, in system one, so in thinking fast, um, there may be approximate uh, ways of uh, reasoning compared to system two, but I, I would still say that we need the formal way. As Hector says, a lot of uh, uh, advancement was done when we figure out the formal way to define 
things and the machinery, then, you know, formal way to define the problem and to define the machinery, even if it's approximate, even if it's a, so what we often say, no, even in this panel is that um, when we don't have this formal way of defining our semantics, then it's when, yes, we can get all these statistic based approaches that uh, are surprisingly doing things that we would not expect, but with very low reliability, with very low explainability uh, and semantics so that we cannot reason on what they say. So um, so that that to me, it, 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 you know, I, I would agree with Hector that we, we need that. And again, the, the semantics is an important part uh, of I agree, interfacing the various uh, modalities that uh, whether you want to call it learning or reasoning or uh, system one and system two and so on. So in my view, my proposal of using this metacognition to, uh, to do an, be an arbiter and do that is, is a way of defining also um, supporting that interface. So you seem to be implying that the innate um, symbol-based knowledge and reasoning approaches must be, that they must be innate, that they must be there before any of the, of the learning begins. Is that correct? Mm, no, I'm not sure about that. No, no. I, I have made that argument. Um, but the, the form of that argument that I've made, going back to my book, The Algebraic Mind, is that you need some thin um, lisp-like representation, although I didn't say it there, um, such that you can represent compositionality, structured representations, abstract algebraic variables, which is why I, I call the book The Algebraic Mind, um, that once you have that, then you can bootstrap a lot of other stuff. And I think <clears throat> probably Josh and I would agree that a lot of these questions are really about like, what is the kernel from which you bootstrap the rest? And I think I've never seen a system actually induce algebraic lisp-like operations per se, but once you have those, and I mean, your work is very relevant to this, then, uh, Stephen, then, then, you know, you can do a lot from there once you have that machinery. And I don't think anybody has really fully delivered on that promise, because I think to do it well, you do need a large scale knowledge st store. Um, and you probably need things like deep learning and so forth involved in the mix to do the, the perceptual work. But th there is some minimal set of representational machinery I think is required. And an interesting thing to note is that a lot of the symbolic machinery revolves around memory and lately deep learning crowd although they don't acknowledge it as such has been bringing that in so there are, there are keyword stores that basically look like symbol systems for example that are increasingly being incorporated in deep learning that are essentially innate symbol manipulating operations um, that are built in in order to get those systems to work so is this is this related at all to a uh, kind of universal grammar uh, envisaged by Chomsky or or a universal innate language ability? I think there has to be some. I mean, it's actually closer to Fodor's view about an innate language of thought. So um, I think there are open questions about what a universal grammar might consist of, and Chomsky has changed his position somewhat over the years. But I think on any reasonable story about language, we innately have the ability to represent structured representations, to have a semantics, to recognize that there's a syntax semantics relationship. Um, maybe if you have a few prerequisites like that, um, the notion that a word can represent things in some fashion, maybe you can bootstrap the rest. But maybe let's say those four things or maybe five or six, something like that, <coughs> those might need to be a prerequisite to the rest. Now, the specific term universal grammar has often been taken to be about language per se, you know, for obvious reasons. It might turn out that a lot of the machinery I just described, but not all of it, isn't specific to language at all. So compositionality is probably not specific to language at all. The capacity to enrich your representational set is probably not specific to language at all. The language is going to build on some set that already exists and maybe some special stuff about syntax semantic relationships and arbitrariness of, of, 
uh, symbols or something like that. So there might be a few extra assumptions that goes into universal grammar, as opposed to Chomsky in the 1980s had very specific things about how you could represent a syntactic tree, what operations you could do over them, and so forth. And may, maybe some of that was wrong and was sort of too demanding on the innate side. It, it's still kind of empirically up for grabs there in linguistics. So are uh, there any other questions that we need to still touch on? Stephen, may I, may I come to add some comments about Luke's question about the interface between machine learning and uh, logic reasoning? Yes, uh, Because please. this comment about uh, learning and reasoning, I think the interface, I agree with Luke that the interface is very, very important. And from my understanding, no matter what kind of interface is, there must be something about the joint numeric symbolic optimization, just as Gary have agreed. And this is very challenging, maybe even more challenging than we have expected. We know the joint discrete and uh, numeric optimization is already very challenging, very difficult. Well, joint symbolic optimization is even more challenging because symbolic ones, including some semantic structures. So my own attempt is try to start from some joint discrete and numeric optimization then trying to put some symbolic semantic as a kind of structure constraint on some group of discrete things, then maybe we can have some way towards that. So would you agree that with Gary that the, the interface is a semantic one? The semantic together with numeric, if, if only with semantic, numeric. Okay. To, yeah. I agree with you agreeing, <laughs> and I agree with your friendly amendment. Um, so I'm just looking at what the, through the many different uh, questions that have come up. Let's go to the end. Uh, question to Josh: What are the chances that a connection is algebraic mind engine will be constructed or learned in the next ten to twenty years? Connectionist algebraic mind engine. I don't know. That sounds like I hope I get theory. some royalties yes. on that. Yeah, this is um, Demetar Kazakov's question. Uh, what are the chances that a connectionist, you mean like that a neural net, that somebody will train a neural net or build and train a neural net that will do what Gary's thing does? Is that the, is that the question? Um, um, I, I don't know. I think the definition of connectionism is not well defined. So um, I think. At some point, somebody might build some. I mean, there, there's certain kinds of neurosymbolic things that that do some of the things that 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 Gary talked about in the algebraic mind. Some of those have already been built. I'm sure if somebody wants to, they can build more of that. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I'm not sure how else to answer that. Um, I was going to make a comment back to the to the previous sort of discussion, which I very much agree with the the call for focus on semantics and Hector's call for formalism. I, I hope you know. Uh, it's, I hope it's clear to, to people here that though I come from cognitive science, you know, the main thing I try to do in cognitive science is provide computational models of these kinds of ideas that, for example, spelke has been talking about. So the ideas about like various kinds of game engine simulators and probabilistic programs. I mean, there's not that much math in game engines, but there is actually some interesting math in terms of like how you hack physics or psychology in order to approximate them. And the math of probabilistic programming uh, both, you know, the semantics of it is, is I think, very interesting and is, is, a, is one foundation that one can build on for reasoning, um, as well as exploit practically in inference algorithms. But just to add in one other um, kind of field or toolkit to the big toolkit that I think this community needs to build and is, and is already starting to embrace, um, the programming languages field. So, you know, I've, I've learned a lot and, and gained a lot of value from interacting with colleagues who come from programming languages, which people haven't traditionally thought of as an area of AI, but you know, you and I'm not an expert on it, so I'm not sure if I would characterize it correctly. But some of my PL colleagues have said, you know, what you do in programming languages is basically about reasoning about code, and if code is the best universal representation we have for thinking, whether it's Fodor's language of thought or McCarthy's Lisp or, or whatever, um, I, I buy into some version of that language of thought idea, and. The PL people are the ones who've developed the math and the and the algorithms for reasoning about code, which means if we want to think about reasoning about knowledge, we should learn from what they've done and work with them. I know that Armando Solar Lazama was giving a talk. It was one of the highlighted talks in, in one of the sessions. I didn't get to see it, but Armando and I have worked together on a number of projects like the Dream Coder work of Kevin Ellis and colleagues that I, I talked briefly about. 
um, and a no work of a number of other students. And I, you know, just in particular there, what we did was we used I techniques from PL to do a kind of semantic refactoring of code or syntactic refactoring, but to preserve semantics that would allow us to build a system that, that doesn't just learn little bits of code to solve a bunch of individual problems, but can build out a domain specific language starting from a much simpler, maybe general purpose language and finding sort of reusable chunks of code that then become new primitives in the language um, that uh, allow you to bootstrap your ability to, to solve more complex problems. And it's a nice example of where PL techniques combined with a hierarchical Bayesian approach to thinking about learning domain representations that, that I and colleagues have worked on for a long time um, together with also a little bit of um, neural networks to, to learn to guide the search, a kind of a system one, system two sort of idea, roughly similar to the AlphaGo type idea. Um, training from synthetic imagined data to help you know, make a, a very hard non-differentiable search problem somewhat smoother and, and more responsive to data. Um, it's a, I think it's a nice example of how, how the synthesis can come together to build systems that you know, make a small step towards the synthesis of learning and reasoning and in response to what gary was saying about you know what do you start with and all that you know like one of the things we show in that in the dream coder work is you can start with a system that basically just has the most minimal mccarthy original version of lisp like basically just uh, uh, lambda calculus car coder cons and and lambda construction um and and with the right sort of uh, mi fairly minimal sort of set of problems to try to solve, bootstrap something that looks like modern functional programming, like a Haskell type language with more powerful um, you know, functional operators. And then from that, you can, if you give it the sort of experience of something, you know, things like physics problems to solve, it can learn DSLs for simple kinds of vector algebra and, you know, phys physics motifs like inverse square laws. Um, so I think that it's a, it's a nice example of, of how you can start with very minimal general languages and build them out into things that have much more the character of domain knowledge. At the same time, there's many things it doesn't do. And some of the other questioners talked about like the need for deep predicate invention. And I think there's limited kinds of predicate invention there. Um, I think we also, but, but not the full kinds that we need that say, for example, when Susan Carey, another developmental psychologist, major thinker who's influenced Gary and me and others in terms of like where, where new concepts come from, you know, to, to address the kinds of real conceptual change that older children do, we're gonna need systems that do deeper kinds of predicate invention and can you know, also construct, invent new kinds of data types. So there's a lot to be done, but I'm just pointing to examples of where the, a set of tools, which include what people have mentioned here, but also um, programming languages methods for thinking about and reasoning about code can at least start to take us down an interesting path. So J Josh, in your talk, you were, you were, you were uh, using a kind of idea of going from a minimal starting point and bootstrapping. Um, which she kind of alluded to again. Um, but J uh, Krisha Broder in her question uh, asks about, oh, well, mentions the kind of notion of having a lot of common sense, which uh, I think uh, was part of the uh, part of the early ideas um, out of Dartmouth and so on, that we need to build up common sense. How much common sense do we need built in? Because that seems kind of non-minimal to me. I mean, if you go all the way to, you know, building enormous databases of uh, you know, knowledge well, well, bases. I, I mean, again, I think that the thing that Gary and I have both been talking about, like channeling insights from our developmental psychology friends like Liz Felke, Susan Carey, and others, and I think Hector seemed to validate this too, the idea that like um, a certain kind of, there's a minimal core of common sense that seems to be built in in, in some form, some proto form to the to the brains of human infants, and also is shared with other non-human animals uh, that have to do with basic representations of objects and agents and goals and some minimal notions of, of causality. Um, and, you know, it's not exactly clear what, what, what the content um, and the form of that core knowledge is, but something like it seems to be built in and is the sort of thing that if we could give that to robots, as I, I gather Gary's trying to do in his company and, and others are trying to do too, that would be hugely valuable. They would have a lot more common sense than they do now. They wouldn't know how to read a newspaper. So in the tradition, in the, in the AI tradition that like Psych um, tried to capture, you know, Doug Lennett's project that says common sense and, and coming from Minsky and others, that common sense is like all the knowledge that an adult human has to read a newspaper. It's not that notion of common sense, but it's, I think the more basic, original notion of common sense. And then I think you combine that 
with the, the kinds of um, learning and reasoning methods that we're all trying to build that we've all been talking about and that can bootstrap off of, of language um, to expand our conceptual systems or as, a, as cues to how to expand our conceptual systems that could ultimately lead to a scaling path that gives you a system that can you know learn from reading and from talking and and listening to people and that and that will that, that will build ultimately something that you know can actually do the things that GPT-3 appears to do, but doesn't really do. Um, so if I, if I, I could jump in. towards the end, not at the beginning, yeah. If I could jump in, I, I think there are two separate questions. One is how much knowledge do you need in order to behave intelligently? Let's say <clears throat> to understand a movie or something like that. Um, and the answer for that one is a lot. And the other is how much knowledge do you need in order to acquire the rest? And some knowledge that humans probably acquire, we might want to build into our machines. So we, for example, probably aren't born knowing a lot about the life cycle and death and, and so forth. We might know enough to stay out of danger, but we probably don't know that if somebody died five years ago, they can't give a lecture today. Um, there's some general piece of knowledge that we have there that is probably acquired and by humans. And then you can ask, well, okay, humans acquire this basic knowledge about death. Um, which they occasionally have to use in inference. Um, do we want our systems to do it? Is it easier just to build it in? Do we want our systems to do it once and then have some kind of you know community peer sharing of that knowledge to other machines? You know, there, there are lots of different ways to think about it. I think that Leonard is right that we can't do really subtle uh, AI without having that large scale, scale knowledge. Um, he tried to hand code it. And, you know, maybe we would do some things differently now if we were engaged in that project. I think we do need that scale of knowledge in order to interpret written text and, and video and so forth. And then the question is, how do we get to that scale of knowledge and have it in a usable form so that it's not completely unwieldy and we can make inferences over it fast enough and so forth? Um, the reason I get frustrated with contemporary AI is it mostly tries to short circuit that knowledge. And Josh was making this point at the end of uh, what he said. So GPT-3 is an example of trying to short circuit that knowledge. And it kind of works and it kind of doesn't. Like I like to give this example in the five minutes that I had access to GPT-3, um, back to work as open AI won't allow me. Um, Ernie Davis and I came up with examples like... Um, you have some cranberry juice, you pour some grape juice into it, what happens? And there's a bunch of kind of distractor words about how you're thirsty and so forth. And the system gets seduced by the distractor systems and says, if you drink the cranberry grape juice mixture, you're going to die, um, which, of course, you're, you're not actually going to die from, from drinking that combination. Um, we have background knowledge as adult humans to make us realize that this is ridiculous. We understand that like mixing two non-toxic things will lead to another non-toxic thing. And that's just routine. Like if, if we watch a movie, we are not going to sit there thinking the guy is going to die because he just drank some grape juice mixed into his cranberry juice. Like you can't reason over a film. And I use a film as an example because we get a whole bunch of new knowledge and we integrate it with a whole bunch of old knowledge really in seamless ways automatically. And getting AI to that level is going to require that that knowledge be av <coughs> available somehow. So, um, so uh, we've only got uh, three minutes left of the extended hour. So, there's a, an interesting question to all. I, I think it'd be nice if you all said something about this one because it's quite general. Can you say something about how you? This is from Adam Dahlgren. How you think the current incentives in the general research environment should change to bring more focus to these ideas related to how people did AI before the winter? Then they said they did logics and now they say they do AI again and get funding and how deep learning has been chasing metrics for the last decade. I think we need a CERN for AI geared around large scale projects that include the large scale knowledge that we need and many of the things that Josh just talked about sort of broadening the approaches beyond just deep learning. And I think that the incentives are all wrong because the incentives are like, how can I make my news feed better? How can I you know, these commercial applications are driving most of, of the research progress. And it's very easy to spit things out with deep learning that make a little progress, but they're not going after the deeper questions that, that several people on our panel really are. Hector? Hector, are you um, there? Yeah. 
um, uh, yeah, the incentives are not good, basically are market oriented, okay? But of course, there are many people that are interested in science, okay? And you care about understanding. And I think that is plenty of room to do in good science and understanding even in toy problems, okay? There are many things we don't understand. So for instance, problems like the interfaces, the semantics, okay? Or that, uh, what is the core basic knowledge of mechanisms, okay? Those can be studied, okay? You need a formulation and then you don't get the mathematics right, okay? So it just talking will not make us progress in AI. So in a sense, I agree with everything that Gary says, but I don't find that useful, okay? So in a sense, we have to move and do mathematics and algorithms. That's the name of the game. Great, um, Francesca Rossi. Yeah, I agree with the the I mean the very high level idea of this CERN for AI, meaning meaning not even a specific uh, you know location or or building or something, but really focus on these 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 basic questions that now are are at the core. You know, now we have a lot of experience in this kind of learning that we have right now, and with a lot of success in some aspects of that. And we have a lot of experience on symbolic reasoning, logic-based reasoning. Now we need to integrate. You know, it, it's clear that one of the two alone uh, kind of the, the research lines is not going to uh, resolve some of the open questions. So now we need to integrate. So the focus has to be in not just deep learning, also the other things, but also as uh, Josh and uh, Gary uh, demonstrate, it has to be also a multidisciplinarity, engaging with people that also are aware of cognitive theories uh, and even maybe go back to people that were involved at the beginning, you know, who led that to have to do with neuroscience, you know, understanding what are the, the components of the brain, how they interact with each other, but definitely cognitive science and AI all, all over AI, you know, integrated uh, the various techniques. And that's the focus that has to be. And that's where the reward mechanism should, uh, should come. Great. Mm -hmm. um, Josh? Yeah, I guess I, I would also say I agree with all these perspectives and just to add a little bit to them. Um, to, to have something like a CERN for AI, which would be great, you, you know, it's, it's, I think it's important that there there was a, a scientific question and a shared sense of, you know, what what, the, what were the questions and what what were the um, fields shared paradigm? Like there was literally a standard model, and CERN was designed to test it and possibly perhaps try to break it, but mostly test it. And you know, we need something like that if we're going to make a big uh, government-funded push here. I, just as Francesca said, I think that. Um, bringing in cognitive science and neuroscience, but especially cognitive science, as see, re returning to see that as part of AI, that AI and understanding human intelligence have a, a really like on the same path, actually. Um, I think that that would be essential for that kind of effort, because then it's, it sets a gold standard, it sets a set of um, milestones that are not just based on economic market factors, but are based on something that is timeless, <laughs> that is trying to understand one of the great scientific questions of all time. And, and having AI researchers focused on questions that are about that, working together with cognitive scientists, I think can provide at least a, a sort of, a, a, if not a, exactly a paradigm, sort of a meta paradigm, and that one that spans a lot of our interests here. And it also goes back to what Hector was saying. I, I, I love working on small scale problems and, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't mind using the word toy problem, but I think that just like what Hector was saying, I think that like deep mathematical understanding of a reasoning in small scale problems, which is undervalued and anti-valued by market driven AI research is fundamental. That's what led to all the, the stuff that I'm talking about, whether it's probabilistic programming or probabilistic uh, neuro symbolic approaches to program synthesis or our intuitive physics work, any of the things in my talk, I think started off and indeed probably are still small scale toy problems and even smaller scale toy ones that you could really deeply mathematically understand. What's great about the connection to cognitive science is something that looks like a small scale toy problem to you know an AI, a big AI company is actually a very good fit for studying precisely and quantitatively the judgments of, of human beings. And this is the bread and butter of what we've done in our cognitive science work and many other people in cognitive psychology. So we can get a lot of data from humans, from human adults, and increasingly also from young children with various tools for doing like web-based experiments with young children and babies. There's starting to be a scalable data pipeline there too. 
Um, I would just call out to the Look It system and Children Helping Science, these platforms developed by my colleagues at MIT and Laura Schultz's lab and the Early Childhood Cognition Lab is just one instance that can get us scalable quantitative data from young children. And these, these allow us to take small scale toy problems that what an AI person would call that and really study them richly with rich scientific data <laughs> that allows the, the fundamental AI advances that Hector's talking about to be grounded on something that, that is as real or more real than anything in the market. And I think that's part of a, of a bootstrapping cycle that can, that can lead uh, our field down, this, down the path we want it to go. Great, um, so that, that's, that all sounds as though it's coming together uh, with, with other, what other people have said, Francesca, Tony? Yes, very quickly, because time is running short. I think that uh, moving away from applications alone is going to be crucial. And uh, looking back at foundations uh, is uh, analogously crucial. Um, and I'll keep it to that. Fantastic. Chiwa Zhe? Uh, so as a machine learning researcher, I just want to say, uh, previously, the machine learning is mostly data-driven. Now we should pay more attention to tasks with less data, but rich knowledge. Great. Okay. Um, so thank you. I think uh, we've we've now uh, had a kind of closing round uh, from everyone. So thank you for all uh, those who've been involved, um, uh, both the keynote speakers with some very interesting perspectives and uh, a lot of um, kind of uh, agreement uh, on what the, the key goals are. Um, I think we need to come to an end now, but thanks to all of those who've put questions in. I hope we've managed to represent um, a, a number of those. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, I hope to see you all at the um, community meeting where we're going to be discussing um, the next, oh, among other things, uh, the, the next, uh, where the next workshop is going to be held. So see you there. Thank you. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thanks. That was fabulous. Great. Thank you.